Center College of Design. Uh, I was their visionary in residence there. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you how this peculiar task came about. Um, I was working on a science fiction novel on the subject of ubiquitous computation, which was a term that was actually invented in California by a, a theorist at the Xerox Park Re Research Lab, the legendary Xerox Park Research Lab. And uh, I remember reading this, uh, you know, this, this paper, which had been written by this uh, design visionary, a computer science visionary, Mark Weiser, the late Mark Weiser. Uh, and I had, he, uh, he had put out his paper on ubiquitous computation in 1981. And um, I had always thought that it was great material for a science fiction novel, because it's really a very alien and extremely far out notion. And then about, I don't know, it must have been 14 years after Weiser's daring prophecy, and something like five years after his death, it began to occur to me that the things Weiser was talking about were not only coming to pass in some vague sense, which is kind of the best one could hope for, but that they probably had applications to another problem, which I had had on my mind for quite a while. And that's this problem. This is the problem of sustainability. Now, this is our society's worst technical and design problem. We go back one slide there. I think we've got the dead internal combustion engine. Yeah. OK. Well, these devices have put so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that they're kind of visibly melting little snow caps you have on your delightful Alps here. And you only have to set a step outside and compare photos of Swiss mountains from 50 years ago to photos of Swiss mountains today to see that the ice is going. Not just on the caps or the South Pole, but on mountaintops around the world. OK, we can go back to the tire pile now. Here's the, some of the things that were attached to the eternal combustion engine. You can see they sort of ran out of use, and there was basically no place to put them. So they're kind of sitting there, and they're going to be moldering, basically, <coughs> as far as the eye can see. Now this is a rather sinister development in a lot of ways. But it's been noticed for quite a while. And there are various theories as to how to get there. Well, you know, theory number one, that which is not sustainable will not be sustained. And if you go and read Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, you can actually see what happens to societies that cannot sustain their material basis. Basically, everyone goes away. And the business just kind of goes into a head spin. You know, sometimes they return. But uh, quite often, it destroys civilization. That's not a good option. Option number two for achieving sustainability is to try to do everything from either natural materials or biomimetically. In other words, if these devices would simply rot, if they were, say, made of bamboo or woven organic materials, it wouldn't be that much of a problem. Basically, you could just chop them up into mulch put them out in the garden, and you know, everything would be hunky-dory. Unfortunately, we actually need the performance specs of things like iron, steel, chlorine, so forth, just in order to earn our daily bread. We can't go out and actually build an industrial society out of bricks, wood, bamboo, or brand new biomimetic, biodegradable materials, which are sort of post-industrial and extremely advanced. I think we ought to move in that direction. I'm all in favor of it. I spent a lot of time studying biobamesis. It's a fabulous field, but it's not ready for prime time. And if we were to try to live uh, you know, uh, with an organic technical infrastructure, we would starve. It just couldn't plow the fields, couldn't ship the food. We would have a collapse. OK, the third scheme for sustainability is basically an arts and crafts invention, which is to sort of say that we should reach a perfect design for our objects and possessions and not get into uh, a, a, a situation of uh, you know, a continued replacements and models, a planned obsolescence situation. In other words, if we had permanent tires, then maybe we could have cars. Right? And they would not do very much environmental damage because we would have one kind of car and one kind of tire. And you would pass the same car and the same tire on to your grandchildren. And they would be made extremely durably. 
Nothing would have to be junked. Nothing would sort of fall off the end of the supply chain. Everything would be built in the way that John Ruskin said that things should be built, out of honest, natural materials and built for the ages with a kind of gothic attention to lasting perfection. And this was Ruskin's design theory. Now the difficulty with that is basically it's a fascist imposition on your children and grandchildren because it basically means that you can't actually reform your society in any way. I mean, let's just say Ruskin's housing, which of course had servants' quarters and room for nine or ten children and some live-in parents. If those were the only kinds of housing we had, we would still have that family structure, right? And we would sort of be forced into that family structure, which over the long term would not be sustainable because Ruskin society was actually booming in population. And everything that they had built was, in fact, not for a sustainable society because they didn't have birth control. If you invent birth control, then you end up with a lot of one-person apartments and little rentals and so forth. But you can't really do that with a Ruskinian society without damaging his design doctrine. Right? If you're following my argument. So we've got three opportunities here so far. Starvation, a more elaborate form of starvation, and a form of social stasis that probably blows us out of the water anyway. But there is a fourth possibility. Let's try the next pick here. This looks like a rather dry book. This is actually one of the best technical manuals on the subject of radio frequency identification objects. And this is at the key of my scheme for a new form of 21st century sustainability. Now, I'm not claiming this is a perfect idea, or that it's the only idea. What I do claim is that it's actually a new idea. <laughs> this is what, you know, which is not to be dismissed out of hand. You know, we don't have that many. Okay, let's try the next pick here. This is a related work by a colleague of mine, Adam Greenfield, Everywhere, the Dawning Age of Ubiquitous Computing. Now, the RFID book by my colleague Simpson Garfinkel is a very good kind of bracer on, uh, on the subject of attaching codes to objects, trackable, traceable codes to objects. Greenfield's book is a rather more visionary and out there scheme, which is about moving computation, as Weiser claimed, from boxes and laptops and distributing it generally through, through objects. In fact, that when you start digging down a little, you find there's a whole series of related terms for the thing I'm describing. I mean, my scheme could be probably best summed up as Weiser's ubiquitous computation in the service of sustainability. Because in this model, you could actually keep track of the toys and fold them up at the end of the day. In other words, instead of simply losing and abandoning our engines and our cast off objects. We can give them all names and numbers, Google them, and try and fold them back into the production stream. This enables us to escape some of the limitations of earlier schemes, and I would also argue it's being done anyway. So what are some of the general concepts associated with this notion? Well, they all have little backers, but let me just recite them, and you can see theorists cutting this problem at slightly different angles, and a lot of them. The Internet of Things. This is an MIT coinage. And in the Internet of Things, real objects like this, this, have net addresses. They have IP addresses, and they can be accessed virtually. <coughs> everywhere, and everywhere, information processing has been removed from the context of the computer and distributed throughout the build environment. Ambient findability. In the ambient findability scheme, the internet converges with global mapping and information architecture to create search engines for reality. 